Welcome back to the classical universe. Today, we are going to be looking at time dilation, which is the cornerstone of Einstein's special theory of relativity. We shall examine the time dilation formula and point out some downsides. Imagine two observers, one in a bus that is moving at speed v, and the other standing on the side of the road. The person in the bus throws a ball vertically upwards with speed u. Since both this ball and the observer are already moving horizontally at the speed of the bus, the observer in the bus will not notice the horizontal speed of the ball. All he will notice is the speed in the vertical direction u. So he sees the ball go up vertically and hits the top of the bus, traveling a distance h. So from his frame of reference, he says that the time t0 that it takes the ball to hit the top of the bus is given by the distance traveled divided by the apparent speed u. However, the observer on the road will not observe the same thing. Since he is stationary with respect to the bus, he will notice both the horizontal and vertical speeds of the ball. And both the person in the bus and the person on the road will see the ball strike the roof at the same time. Remember that the horizontal speed of the ball is given to it by the bus. And this is equal to the speed of the bus, which is v. The vertical speed, on the other hand, is provided by the person on the bus, which is equal to u. Because of these two speeds, the observer on the road will see the ball trace an inclined path like so, with a speed w, which is equal to the resultant of the two speeds. So, the observer on the platform sees the ball travel a longer distance s to hit the top of the bus. In his frame of reference, the time t1 that it takes the ball to reach the top is equal to the distance s over the speed w. Look at the diagram. By the time the ball hits the top of the bus, traveling the height h, it would have also moved a horizontal distance v times t1. So by Pythagoras, we have s squared equal to v times t1 squared plus h squared. But s is also equal to w times t1. So this equation can also be written as follows. Making t1 the subject of the formula yields this. You can pause the video here and try to derive it to confirm. It is at this point that Einstein made a radical assumption that led to the time dilation formula. In Einstein's thought experiment, he used a light beam in the place of the ball. He radically assumed that the light will travel at the same speed both when it is traveling vertically and when it is tracing the inclined path. The idea that something can tra travel a longer distance at the same speed, in the same time without any energy addition, baffles me deeply. But let me leave that for now, as I will address it in the later part of this video. In that case, u is equal to w, which is equal to c, speed of light. So, t0 becomes h over c, and t1 becomes h over c, divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared on c squared. So we see that t1 is equal to gamma t0, where gamma is equal to 1 over this square root. And this is the time dilation formula. This formula is the cornerstone of special relativity and is based on the assumption that light will travel at the same speed in both cases. Now let's look at the motion of the light beam in more detail. I wish to, first of all, reiterate the fact that we arrived at our formula by examining the interaction between the ball and the bus. The big question now is, since the bus is able to interact with the ball to add its speed, does it 
also interact with the light in the same way or in any other way? The answer to this question is either a yes or a no. Since our whole analysis has been based on this interaction, it is the answer to this question that will determine the validity of the spatial theory of relativity. I am going to pretend not to know the answer and just work out the problem for both cases. The case of no interaction. Let the light source be a bulb fixed to the floor of the bus. When the switch is closed, the light spreads out in a sphere and travels in all directions at speed c. The bus horizontally, so the vertical distance between the light bulb and the roof of the bus is unaffected. The medium through which light propagates, being it the eater or whatever, is stationary with respect to the bus. That is why the light will have the same speed it in all directions, including the direction of motion of the bus. Let's pick two rays, one traveling vertically upwards and the other through an inclined path exactly as in our initial problem. So, its horizontal distance is still v times t naught, where t naught is equal to h over c, the time it takes the light in the first case to go up vertically. We are allowed to use t naught for the horizontal distance because we chose an inclined ray that strikes the roof at a position such that the horizontal distance is the same as in our previous example. And this is just for simplicity. Let the inclined distance be represented as d. By Pythagoras' theorem, this distance is given as follows. So, the time it takes the light to travel the inclined path is equal to the distance over the speed. Noting that h over c is equal to t naught, t1 can be written as follows. Since v and c are both square, the square root is always greater than 1. So, t1 is always greater than t naught. In plain English, this means that the time it takes the light to travel the inclined path is always greater than the time it takes it to travel the vertical path. This inclined path is the path as seen by the stationary observer outside the bus. This means he will see the light take a longer time to travel the inclined distance. This contradicts Einstein's assumption that the observer outside will see the light hit the roof at the same time as the observer inside the bus. The case where the light is affected by the bus. In this second case, we assume that the bus increases the speed of the light such that it travels the inclined path as seen by the observer outside. Therefore, the inclined speed w is equal to the square root of c squared plus v squared. The inclined distance d is the same as we derived earlier. So, the time it takes to traverse the inclined path is given by the distance over the speed as follows. Squaring both sides and factoring out c squared from the denominator, and noting also that h over c is equal to t naught, this expression can be simplified to t1 equal to t naught. So, the only condition in which the observer outside the bus will see the light hit the roof at the same time as the observer inside the bus is if the bus increases the speed of the light, and this violates Einstein's first postulate that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames. So you see, whether you answer yes or no to the big question I asked, you cannot have special relativity. In other words, whether you take the speed of light to be constant or not, you still will not have time dilation and special relativity. 
Besides, the idea that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames is completely wrong because we know that light travels at different speeds in different media. So, if the bus experiment was done instead in a submarine and a stationary observer on the seashore, could you still claim that the speed of light will be constant? The experiment that brought in this idea in the first place is the Michelson Morley experiment, and I showed that this experiment is wrong in the first video of this Relativity playlist. The video will pop up on your screen at the end of this video. You can also check out the link in the video description or simply go to the Relativity playlist. In case you don't believe me or just decide to think that I am wrong because this goes against everything that you have been taught, let me pretend that I am with you just for a minute and agree that spatial relativity is correct. So, let's look at the consequence of that. Length contraction. Assuming you are in a spaceship traveling from point A to point B in space, according to the spatial theory of relativity, the space between A and B will contract. That is, fall in on itself to make the separation shorter so that at your same speed you complete the trip in a shorter time. According to general relativity, space is a real thing that is malleable. If the space between A and B contracts, where did it get the energy to do so? Because in general relativity, mass provides that energy. If you ask your lecturer this question, he will say, no, 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 the space in between A and B only appears to contract according to the person in the, in the spaceship. At this point, I will ask, how can you travel at apparent distance in real time? Do you see how they mix things that appear to be and things that actually are? Same as a stick immersed in water that appears to bend. But does it really bend? If it had to, then it will require some external energy. If you in the spaceship perceive and believe that the distance you will travel is shorter, no problem. But your ship must travel the actual distance between points A and B regardless. This idea of perception almost caused me to drown when I started learning how to swim. I stood in front of a pool that was, was about 2.8 meters deep, but I didn't bother to check the depth because the water appeared shallow to me. But when I dived in, I realized I kept sinking. So I cried out with a loud voice like Peter cried to Jesus during the storm and I was rescued. So, even though the height appeared shorter, I still had to travel the actual distance because that is the reality. Your spaceship will do the same. This means space does not actually contract simply because you are moving. So, spatial relativity is wrong because that is what it predicts. This is the same thing with time dilation if we were to assume that spatial relativity is correct. There are many other paradoxes that I can derive from this theory. So I leave you with this quote of mine. Any theory that leads to a paradox is wrong or for the most part incomplete. That is all for today's video. See you again in the next video.